pleased um, to be able to have this platform, really, which is about, I think it's really just about giving people an opportunity, particularly giving uh, many of our early career researchers and PhD students an opportunity to share their research, present their research, get feedback, have a, have a conversation around their research. And I think to really just showcase a lot of the diversity of the research that we have going on across the School of Security Studies. Um, so we're delighted today to welcome, um, we've got two speakers. We've do got Dr. Ronald um, T and Yautosini, uh, and I'll just take the liberty um, of introducing them both. So Dr. Ronald T, um, who's going to be presenting first, is a final year doctoral candidate um, at DSD in the Defence Studies Department here, uh, researching uh, the NATO military logistic resilience of tactical units during NATO Article 5 large scale combat operations. Uh, Ron completed an MA in military history and strategic studies at Maynooth uh, University in Ireland and um, was previously a health, uh, force health protection specialist in the Australian Defence Force, um, as well as training in aviation medicine, uh, underwater medicine, uh, aeromedical evacuation. And for the past 20 years has worked as a medical, uh, mi military medical log logistician, uh, if I can say that, and staff officer. Um, so his career has included seven operational deployments, three of those with the UN and a defence cooperation programme posting in Papua New Guinea, British Army Overseas Exchange, and appeared as a defence contractor in the Middle East and West Asia. So a really uh, richly diverse background. You could um, say that. <laughs> Ron, yeah. Um, and then also delighted to welcome today Yautasini. Uh, so um, how is a PhD candidate? at uh, Sao Paulo State University and a visiting researcher in the Defence Studies Department at King's. Uh, he's a writer for the UK Defence Journal, covering issues related to British power and standing worldwide. He's a member of um, the UNESCO's Defence and International Security Studies Group, the Navy Records Society and the Army Records Society. Um, Yao yeah, holds a Master of Arts in International Relations from the Department of International Relations at Sao Paulo. Uh, and his current focus is the relative decline of the UK in the post-Cold War era and the British position within an increasingly competitive international system. Um, so um, some very, um, very contemporary, very timely uh, topics today that both our speakers are going to be presenting on. And I think unless there's any questions, um, what we'll do is each speaker's got 15 minutes with around 10 for discussion um, or up to 10. And then I think for all those who are online, um, if you can just uh, perhaps either uh, put your hand up if you have a question once we open for questions or feel free to put them in the chat and I will monitor the chat. But I think um, that's it from me. Uh, very much over to you, Ron. OK, uh, thank you, Alan, for that kind introduction and thank you, Dr. Chris Tuck, for being my discussant. OK, yeah, welcome, ladies and gents. Uh, just 10 minute meeting is uh, on presenting my my you know earlier career research and what you're seeing there is my PhD topic um, like most PhD topics is a little bit verbose but in essence I'm looking at uh, what influences resilience at in that at the tactical level in NATO military logistic units and how we can ex uh, establish this awareness at the tactical level to improve survivability in NATO article 5 large-scale combat operations um, so all of those, out there, hopefully most of you, even if you don't have a military hat, that will actually all make some sense. So let's just go on. Okay, so just a quick slide here and a little bit of an intro just to say, folks, this is a little bit like, uh, you know, the three minute thesis on steroids. Uh, so I'm going to do it over 10 minutes. Um, I've actually given a previous New Voices seminar um, and, and that was actually a 40 minute talk where I talked about um, tactical level military logistic resilience. This is strictly going to be what am I actually researching? But if you've got any questions at the end, obviously that's where we're going to where we're going to pick it up. This slide is just to talk about NATO Article Five, just in case you know you're, you're not aware of it. Unlikely, which the famous Article Five, an attack on one is considered an attack on all. My opinion about this is that is all very well, but then people have actually got to agree that it's an Article Five situation. Large-scale combat operations is a US term from Field, Man uh, Field Manual 3-0, and I've deliberately used the US term because the US has major warfighting doctrine, 
Uh, NATO does not, in my humble opinion. Oh, by the way, all these opinions that I express in this talk are not the official view of the Department of Defence, the Ministry of Defence or King's College. Right, back to message. So I'm using large scale combat operations because as you can see from that definition there, there are words like lethal, brutal, fear, violence and enemies. Uh, and I haven't used NATO's MJO term, uh, um, uh, major joint operations, because I think a lot of that NATO warfighting doctrine is watered down. So LS, LSCO uh, is used. Um, the, the, my thesis actually originated from the thought of resilience. This was, I guess, first enunciated at the 2016 Warsaw Ministers Summit, um, and it's been promulgated through NATO, uh, through a couple of agencies. But my main beef about uh, resilience in NATO is that it's all strategic. Uh, there is nothing, well, I've got limited, but really there's nothing of application for operational level military commanders. So it's all about uh, infrastructure, it's all about power, it's all about uh, public health, it's all about bridges. That's all very well, but we need to actually operationalize resilience and apply it at the, at the sub-operational tactical levels. And that's what this research attempts to start doing. Um, just a quick word about resilience. What we have there is a fairly generic resilience curve. So on the y-axis, you've got performance. On the x-axis, you've got time. I'm sure, hope, hoping, I'm sure that most of you have seen this curve. So basically, you get on the curve the moment of disruption, which is in the case of my uh, research, a NATO Article 5 attack. I'll rephrase that, an attack triggering NATO Article 5 from the east. It's not going to come on NATO from Australia, I can tell you. It'll come from the east. And at that point, there is a first response and you get um, the classical stages of resilience known as absorption, adaptation, transformation. In my literature research from my PhD, it's generally agreed across all the disciplines, uh, materials engineering, systems engineering, supply chain management, ecology, that this is a generic resilience curve. Uh, complex adaptive systems theory is stuck there because uh, one of the original contributions to knowledge in my thesis is that military logistic systems are complex adaptive systems. Now, while that may be intuitive, no one's actually written it down until now. So even though we, we recognise that fighting wars and armies and warfare itself is a complex adaptive system, there actually isn't any literature that I can find that documents this. Sidebar, military logistics is a surprisingly understudied topic. And I think part of the reason for that is it's taken up between supply chain management, which is not military logistics, uh, and that's an academic discipline. And I think the other half of it is actually trade journals. So you'll get things like the US Logistic Journal or Army Logistic University. It's mostly opinion pieces, excellent opinion pieces by professional military officers, but it ain't research. So this thesis, I'm intending that it occupies this central area between professional trade journals and academic research. Here are my three research questions. Um, I'll give you time to quickly read through that as I'm speaking, but you can see that uh, basically I'm proposing to ask what factors influence resilience or make up resilience. Question two, what theoretical approach? No prizes for guessing that, complex adaptive systems. And with research question three, I actually used a hybrid methodology in a novel way to improve um, awareness of resilience during a NATO Article 5 collective exercise. More on that later. But they're the three research questions that this research has set out to answer. The research itself was constructed as an exploratory sequential series. So I constructed research based on stage one and stage two. Uh, I didn't amend this slide. It's a very early slide. I actually used mixed methods in both stages. I used qualitative methods um, in the form of interviews and I used quantitative method in the form of a survey. Um, stage one looked at the first research question, which is that one, what are the key input factors? And stage two looked at the third research question. Can we apply a hybrid methodology to increase awareness? 
the two linked together form an exploratory sequential series. So the stage one research methodology, as I mentioned, was cons it's a mixed methodology. It means you're using bits of both types of uh, research collection uh, methodology, qualitative and quantitative. Um, with the data collection, I applied interviews. I coded that. I used NVivo coding software. There are a number of products on the market. Uh, I then also used reflective, refle reflexive thematic analysis to analyze all the interviews. Uh, and for the quantitative part, I actually use descriptive and inferential statistics. Pretty basic stuff. Uh, weighted mean, median, standard deviation. So I looked at um, measures of central tendency and I looked at measures of spread. And the population was a population of 14 NATO military logistic officers in a given rank range who were professional military logistic officers in a NATO military. So for instance, um, the British uh, interviewees that I did had re recently retired from the military. Um, so they um, weren't subject to a, a, a ethical approval through the MOD. So it was a N of 14. <clears throat> Regarding the conceptual framework for military logistic resilience, I found that there were three principal resilience input factors, individual factors, organisational factors, and what I call battle space factors. And where these have come from are out of my literature review and my research evidence, which is the data I co collected from research. Now, looking at that, it all seems pretty intuitive. Of course, individuals uh, have an influence on resilience. And of course, the organization does. Battle space, what is battle space? In that, I'm talking about things like the dispersal of a, of a unit, the mobility of a unit, the management of the electron man magnetic signature of a unit, the use of offensive fires, and in particular, I considered Russian artillery doctrine, which looks as at intense area fires. When you actually look at those three uh, factors, it's fairly intuitive, and you might say, well, of course these are the three factors, but it isn't stated anywhere. So that's the first original contribution to knowledge. My stage two research methodology, I actually ran a medical logistic tabletop exercise. So what I did was I ran two war games with the Estonia Ministry of Defence during the annual spring exercise called Kevad Turm in Estonian, which stands for spring storm. And I interviewed participants before the logistic tabletop and after the logistic tabletop. And the aim of this uh, stage two was to try and prove that a hybrid methodology, and the methodology was a qualitative data collection method, which was interviews, coupled with a war game, the hybrid methodology, could get the result that I wanted. And I basically analysed that data in the same way as I've indicated in the previous slides. I had an N of, five, of 10, which is actually five uh, military logistic officers before the event and five after the event. Now, I don't have time to explain how the war game was run, but it was a war game that actually simulated the movement of medical supplies. You know, in the Australian Army, we use a 10 item logistics system, class eights, if you're an American or Australian, New Zealander, Belgian or Portuguese out there. But NATO uses a five item logistic classification, so they're really class twos. But this war game, which I designed and put together, can actually be used with class threes, fuel, class fives, ammunition, or class ones, food and water. Whatever uh, logistic item you put in the system, you can war game that. Why did I use blood? Because I'm a military medical logistician, and two, blood is the least resilient logistic item in all of the NATO stock numbers that any logistic unit can hold. So I used blood because it's so unreal resilience. So if you put a bag of blood on the table within an hour, two hours, the platelets don't clot anymore. All you've got is a bag of protein that does nothing. Uh, the logistic war game was done, as I said, during the annual Estonian military exercise. I ran two war games. I reported only on the first for the PhD research because the second was actually a sib mill exercise that I did not write up for this PhD. That was a bit of the payoff to the Estonians. I ran the first war game to help their military and to help my research. The second war game was actually to start a national resilience conversation on their strategic blood supply. And I had participants from all the groups that you see there. So 
EFP Battle Group Estonia, for those who don't know, is the Enhanced Forward Presence uh, Battle Group in Estonia that is led by the UK. SJFHQ is Standing Joint Force Headquarters UK, which is also responsible for the Joint Expeditionary Force. 84 MEDSUP, that stands for Medical Supply Squadron. 9 Log Regit RLC stands for the 9th Logistic Regiment Royal Logistic Corps. And RAN, yes, it does stand for what you thought it does, the Royal Australian Navy. So here's a happy snap of the directing staff with myself in the middle with a slouch hat. Um, and the CIVI was the Royal Australian Navy officer. And as you can see, it was a very low fidelity exercise held indoors. And again, I won't go into the, uh, you know, long winded explanation of how this was done, but the essence of it was showing battle maps. So a typical battle map would be shown to the training audience. And then after a certain period of time, I would advance that battle map. And we then, as I've described, did pre and post war game interviews to see if the awareness had increased, which it did. So there are three original contributions to knowledge from my research. My, my research confirms that the resilience conceptual framework that I proposed is in fact comprised of those three factors, individual, organisation, battle space. The second original contribution to knowledge is that based on literature view and theoretical analysis, not empirical, I demonstrated that mill log systems, military logistic systems, display all the essential characteristics of complex adaptive systems. The third original contribution knowledge is I demonstrated that the hybrid methodology that I've, I've skipped over really quickly, which was qualitative data analysis, sorry, correction, mixed methods analysis and a war game did increase resilience awareness. Now the so what of all this just quickly is that if we understand that mill log systems are CASAs, complex adaptive systems, we can better understand their behavior and we can better manipulate them to be more resilient. The first uh, original contributional knowledge is obviously a touch point where we can operationalize uh, resilience. Interestingly, one of the observations I found was the knowledge of Russian offensive doctrine amongst the training audience was in, at points abysmally low. For instance, very few military, NATO military logistic officers mentioned the importance of electronic signature management, which is a critical factor in survivability in Ukraine. The third, uh, original contribution knowledge about the wargaming and mixed methods actually validated a low cost, low fidelity training solution without actually having to put troops in the field. So they are, that's my name, that's my uh, King's College uh, email. I welcome you to uh, reach out with any questions. And that's basically my three minute thesis done in 11 minutes. So I'll stop presenting now and I will leave it to my discussant, Dr. Tuck. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ron. Um, that was really interesting and, and a really important topic. So, um, I mean, I think that the, the research that you're engaged in, I think is, cl is clearly relevant um, and, and significant, not least, first of all, because you're looking at logistics, which uh, very often is neglected yeah. or, or in fact Absolutely. often entirely ignored in Absolutely. thinking about contemporary and future war. And of course, as we've seen in Ukraine, um, the foundation for the effective prosecution of combat operations is logistics. It's a logistics flow. Um, it is the foundation which everything else flows. I think what's also interesting to me and important is your focus on resilience because um, thinking on contemporary and future war is often very much focused on what it is that we will do to our adversaries. So maneuver warfare, for example, is founded on this idea that we will be inflicting systemic shock and dislocation upon them, ignoring the fact that war is a fundamentally relational activity. So in order for us to be able to inflict um, harm or to impose control over an adversary, we also have to be able to protect those things that they will also be trying to attack. Um, and uh, I think also that that focus on um, uh, large scale combat operations, because clearly that is the flavor, well, I say the flavor of the month and that sounds dismissive. It's not, that is the main focus of, of, of Western militaries. Uh, at the moment. So I think that what you're doing is really important. 
Uh, so it's just some observations, which in fact, I think are, are really questions. Um, the, the first issue for me, I think, would be the issue of um, that uh, large scale combat operations context. We seem to be trapped at the moment in terms of our thinking about future war in debates that are between the poles of everything has changed. You know, we're now in the middle of a an information based military revolution. Everything is changing. It's an inflection point in human affairs. And on the other hand, those would argue that nothing really uh, has changed at all. And so for me, one question would be, to what extent can you generalize about your large scale combat operations context, given that we have an ongoing debate about what that context might actually look like? There's a lot of theorizing, which has led to concepts and doctrines related to multi-domain operations. There's a lot of um, assessments of the various sorts of trends that are generating you know, more transparent, more lethal battlefield, more hyperactive battlefield. But um, we know that every war is different. Uh, so to what extent can you generalize about this LSCO context when it comes to um, the challenges it's posing? So that, that would be the first issue. Uh, the second issue, and I guess it's, it's related to that, would be, so you mentioned your focus on Russian artillery doctrine and, and their approaches there in, in terms of, of attack. And um, would different adversaries change the resilience problem? Uh, would a different uh, mix, for example, between uh, mass or precision fires or between uh, kinetic attack and non-kinetic attacks, cyber, for example, would that change the nature of the resilience problem? What impact might that have? Uh, my third observation is is, is related to um, the sort of theoretical approach that you've that, that, that you've taken here, and you've looked at a variety of different literatures, which I think are really interesting, um, and I think a an interesting corrective to I think someone like me who who would have a particular a particular approach to this problem. But I was wondering to what extent you have looked at the uh, academic literatures on military adaptation and innovation. And I asked that question because you talk about in relation to complex adaptive systems, issues of absorption, adaptation, transformation. But what that literature does do is to highlight the ways in which different organizations are um, variable in their receptiveness to change. So, so in terms of the extent to which organizations can absorb and then adapt or transform might depend on issues to do with things like military culture, uh, civil military relations, um, intra, service and inter-service rivalries and so it'd be I, th I think that's important I think because you talk about you know a generic resilience curve and and in terms of your implications um, you talk about um, individual organizational and battle space resilience but um, the extent to which individuals um, and organizations make themselves more resilient uh, uh, might depend to a certain extent on attributes of those organizations or, or other other factors so it would be the variability i suppose in the ability of individuals and organizations to to re to, to actually absorb adapt and transform it would be interesting to have your views on that and then my final point i think uh is also linked to that and that's that's the very interesting point you're focusing on NATO, um, which I think is really interesting, because I think often there, there tends to be a national focus. You know, or look at you know British perspectives on this, or US perspectives, or what have you. You're looking at, at the NATO perspective, and um, I wonder then the extent to which that has implications for your conclusions. So, by facing at the NATO level. Um, uh, you're looking at a collection of states. So to what extent does the resilience problem vary between different NATO actors? 
and coming back to issues of absorption, adaption and transformation to different countries uh, have different problems uh, or, or um, are, are more adaptive. I, 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 I don't know. Um, and then also the extent to which you're focusing on individuals and organisations. So we know that the levels of war interconnected issues that will, that will manifest um, at the uh, tactical operational level will have implications further upwards, but also presumably, although you're focusing at the organisational and in, and 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 uh, uh, sorry, at the operational tactical levels and the organisational and individual uh, levels, presumably features of that strategic level context would cascade downwards and have implications. So um, I'd be interested to know to what extent um, focusing on NATO as an organisation might produce varied conclusions depending on which of the NATO members you're looking at, or indeed if when we're looking at a different organisation or, or a national structure, whether your conclusions might, might differ. It, you know, the characteristics of NATO as a multinational organisation, does that have implications for your research? So uh, a really interesting scheme of research, uh, uh, Ron, and I will be um, really fascinated to read uh, the, the, the final thesis. So thank you very much for that. So, but those are my observations, um, which, I, which I think are also questions. So thanks very much for that. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. Um, uh, Ellen, do I reply at this point or do uh, yeah. have we run out of time? No, no, I think um, if you reply, Ron, and just sort of um, respond to, to Chris's observations, I think um, just in the interest of time, because um, Gao's discussant has to leave at 1.30, I think we'll start um, the second presentation around five past. So just for five or six minutes, if you'd like okay. to respond. And then what we can do is if there's questions that come up, we can always take them later on. Roger that. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chris, for your really thoughtful points. And thank you, because this is the sort these are the sorts of points my examiners are probably going to ask me in London in October, taking them in reverse order. Why NATO? Will there be variability at the national level? Absolutely. Um, I, I picked on NATO because it's a supranational organisation and NATO does issue its own doctrine and the resilience teaching has come from NATO. Um, what I guess colours all of my replies to you is that a PhD is a piece of research, but it's a piece of research that has to be achieved uh, with measurable progress in a reasonable time. And I think of all those four questions you've asked me, they are all open to further research, which I'm considering doing postdoc. And certainly the operationalisation of resilience principles for NATO is one of those questions that needs to be answered. And I certainly found in my research, there was definitely cultural variability. So with my populations of 14 and five, it's produced for a PhD with the greatest respect, but it needs a much bigger research um, uh, sort of population. Um, I think also, uh, what is the other, the, the variety of different locations, um, yes. You were talking about, you know, how do organisations adapt? How do cultures input into organisations and so on? They are all things that you can drill down from these three essential elements that I've identified, individual, organisational, battle space. Battle space factors were, were what I loosely defined as things happening in the battle space. So Russian offensive doctrine was a battle space input factor. And in part of my research, I actually identified the dynamic between mobility, dispersal, artillery, command and control. And I was able to actually graph this on an X, Y axis and create a, a relationship from it that may actually be manipulatable in the future. But they were all things that, that, that yes, obviously can lead to further study and can be drilled down. But again, for a PhD, to look at inter-service rivalries, that's a level of granularity I, I just didn't have space for in a, in a PhD. Um, and certainly, yeah, it's it's this this PhD is localised at large-scale combat operations. I mean, to what extent um, is that referable to anywhere else? Um, good point. Um, part of the early part of my PhD, I actually talk about um, uh, um, operations on the spectrum of warfare. So large scale combat operations occupy one uh, um, extreme of the spectrum, 
according to Field Manual 30, and peace support and peacekeeping operations are the other um, factor. So obviously along this entire spectrum, all these resilience factors and influence will be variable. So I had to try and make my PhD as narrow as possible, practical, but as deep as possible. So I went for, I went for narrowness, specificity and depth. Um, I hope I've kind of answered those questions and I'm conscious of the fact that it's a couple of minutes and I think I will stop there. Um, yeah, and the one about the your, your second question about, um, you know, does resilience vary with different adversaries? Absolutely. So I have established a basic uh, set of input factors that requires granularity. So underneath organisation, one can consider things like culture, inter-service rivalry, defence policies, um, you know, religious context, perhaps. Um, there are all sorts of things that you can look at, but what we have here is very broad categories that can be drilled down later on, obviously not in my PhD. My last thought is this, one very important exclusion in my PhD was I come from a force health protection background. I didn't consider individual psychological, clinical psychological resilience. That is a huge volume of literature in the health sciences, but I, I deliberately excluded it because that's a PhD on its own and that's a health sciences PhD. It's not really a defence studies PhD. So I actually, I actually parked that topic, but there's a lot of stuff in it and my PhD pays recognition to, to that huge kind of subfield of individual resilience. I hope I've answered the questions there and I'm going to stop because I don't want to take time from the other speakers. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you, Chris, for your really intelligent comments and very helpful comments. Thanks very much, Ron. Really interesting presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ron. I just echo Chris's um, observation there and, um, and for your responses as well. Um, if people in the audience online do have questions for Ron that that, that come just as, as we we go through, please feel free to put them in the chat um, and uh, hopefully we will have some time at the end uh, to pick up any questions. Um, but we do have a second speaker today. Your presentation is on the strategic position of the UK and the Indo-Pacific from the early 1990s to the early 2020s. First, thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is, is Juan Vitor Tosini. I'm from the I'm a Brazilian student here as a visiting researcher uh, at the King's College of London. And this presentation here about the presence of the UK in the Indo-Pacific and South Atlantic is more a, a exploratory research. Uh, it's in a very early stage one. It's partially a result of my master's degree, uh, especially the, the points about the South Atlantic. Now in the PhD, I'm studying, studying more about the UK and the Indo-Pacific. So it's a article, a project of an article that is still in its early stages, a conception phase, let's say. So uh, the what I'm trying to do with this article here is basically a overall exploratory uh, analysis about the characteristics of the UK in those two regions, uh, mainly uh, within the, the field of discussions about power projections and the role of the British overseas territories for Britain's power projection capabilities. So as you can see, my next slide here, this, yes. These are the current overseas territories of the UK. Uh, Britain has around has currently uh, 13 claims, ter 13 territories overseas, plus one claim in of the British Antarctic Territory, uh, resulting in 14 territories overseas. And as you can see in the next one, in the next slide, some of these territories overlap. You know, they overlap with some major British bases overseas, mainly, of course, the Falkland Islands in the South Atlantic. Ascension Island, Gibraltar, uh, the sovereign base areas in Cyprus, and the British Indian Ocean Territory. <clears throat> so, advancing to the question, or uh, this thing, uh, this overlapping, your red shows what I'm trying to highlight in this article as well, is as already as a preliminary, preliminary conclusion that the the UK, the way of British warfare, the way of British power projection, still relies, at least in at least in part, 
in, on its overseas territories. Things haven't changed that much since the early 20th century in the sense that it's still necessary uh, to have established bases overseas to really have a global reach. So this is the main point about the overseas territories in this article and how this and, and the next one is how these territories provide Britain with a regional presence in the South Atlantic and to a lesser extent in the Indo-Pacific. So the question of power projection of the UK and power projection since the 1990s is market is characterized by a few points that I should note before advancing to the specifics of British presence in the South Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific. The main, th the main thing we should know about the, the UK capabilities uh, since the, in the end of the Cold War is mainly the effect and the consequences of the peace dividend and the return of the dispensary approach. That, result, that, that resulted in a few, uh, a few things. First, firstly, you have the, the British government in the post-Cold War era much more with a willingness, with an increased willingness to commit British forces overseas, meaning more deployments in the 90s than in the decades before. So that resulted with the peace, combined with the peace dividend, which is basically cuts to the defense budget. Uh, for example, we have in 1990 a budget, a British defense expenditure of 4.1% of GDP. By 1997, we have just 2.7% of GDP. That's more or less what Britain extends, expands now, or, which is around 2.2% of its GDP. So this resulted, of course, in smaller forces than compared to the time that Britain deployed to the South Atlantic against Argentina in 1982. But it also meant that Britain was now returning to its traditional expeditionary focus. That uh, expeditionary capabilities in the 90s, uh, now we have as a consequence of that re return to expeditionary approach, for example, the carrier, the carriers, the Queen Elizabeth class of aircraft carriers uh, have their inception in these years. But that also led to a military overstretch. Britain committed itself to operations in Sierra Leone, in the Balkans, in the Middle East, and by the end of the decade, uh, military overstretch, meaning uh, increased commitment with a downgraded conventional capability in the sense of manpower, in sense of size, uh, resulted in that kind of overstretch. And of course, with decreased military assets, the relevance of already established bases and territories only increased. And then, and that's the point uh, within the discussion that I'm going to analyze, uh, that, that's the discussion about the South Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific that I'm going to explore more in depth here. For example, why is that the case? Is that the case? mainly because in the South Atlantic, Britain's presence there is based completely, without exception, on its overseas territories. Britain has the Ascension Island, has St. Helena, has the Falkland Islands, and all the British military presence in that area revolves around the defense policy of maintaining British sovereignty. So it's a defensive one. But despite that, despite its defensive stance in the South Atlantic, uh, the United Kingdom has a very comfortable position in that, in that region, mainly due to, the, to one factor, and that is Britain is the only major power, uh, including, for example, the permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, that has a permanent military presence in that region, along with a territorial presence. Not even the United States has that kind of military presence there. To, and that is highlighted by the fact that the United States and Britain share a base, a, a military facility on Ascension Island. 
And since the war in the South Atlantic, we have a sharp increase in British pre military presence in that area. And the normalization of relations with Argentina in the 90s didn't change things a lot. Uh, actually, we, see, we can point to a decrease of overall presence, but uh, the overall British military presence in that area remained stable. Uh, of course, the cuts to the military budget have, they have consequences to overseas military presence and the South Atlantic and the British case in the South Atlantic is not an exception. We see some cuts, some uh, cuts to the naval forces deployed there. For example, the Atlantic Patrol Task in South, which was performed by a major Royal Navy surface vessel, meaning a destroyer or a frigate, uh, no longer occurs. So in practice, the Falkland Island Patrol ship, current, currently HMS Forth, uh, operates in the South Atlantic, carrying out the duties of both tasking, that, the, both tasking forces. So uh, th in that case, you can see some changes to overall presence in that region. In part, we can say that investments in military infrastructure compensated that. That's true. Uh, Britain invested, continued to invest on its military assets on the Falklands and the, on Ascension Island. The airport in St. Helena in, uh, opened, that opened in 2016 also contribute in part to the air bridge, to securing the air bridge between Britain and the Falklands. Uh, and that leads to the conclusion about South Atlantic that you have a stability in overall numbers since the late 1990s, and also a very comfortable position, strategic position for the United Kingdom. Meanwhile, in the South Indian Pacific, uh, we have a much more complex situation. Uh, Britain is not only is not the only one, the only major power there. Actually, Britain is, a, is we could say that is a, the, the United Kingdom is a returning power to the region in the sense that now it has some sort some sort of uh, long term strategy within the discussions about global Britain and the British tilt to the Indo-Pacific, which it didn't have mainly after the. 70s, the withdrawal from East of Suez in 1971, which also, as well, I should point out that the handover of Hong Kong in 1997 uh, marked the end of the United Kingdom as the major European power in those regions. It doesn't, it, when I say that, I'm not trying to say that the UK had a very important role, in, a strategic role in that region. It had Hong Kong, it had uh, and the consequent military assets deployed there to, for the for defense purposes. But it also meant that compared to other European powers, the UK had a permanent position in the region, which changed after 1997. Between 1997 and the mid-2010s, uh, the UK engagement especially when we talk about defense engagement with the region and military deployments were very scarce. Facilities under the British flag there remained readily used, which is the case, we can point to the case of Singapore, the, the Singapore support unit, and the facilities, the training forces in Brunei and Kenya, they were used as not as a part of a regional engagement, as a regional approach to the region, but but instead employed as tools for British training and deployment elsewhere, mainly in the Middle East. So their purpose, their, their main objective that Britain had with those facilities was not of a one of a regional engagement, but as a source of power elsewhere of engagement elsewhere. So that changed, that started to change in the mid 2010s. We have a resurgence, resurgence in the British engagement with the region and consequently of British military presence. So as a contrast to the South Atlantic, uh, while we have a stable presence in that region, in the, in the Pacific we have a 
expanding present in in terms of numbers and military facilities. Britain opened a large bases in Oman, uh, started to use with more frequency uh, the support unit in Singapore. In Singapore, Brunei and Kenya are now considered within uh, with possible engagements regionally. For example, in the integrated review of 2021, uh, the British government indicated the possibility of expanding the way its, its presence in Kenya is handled, and that would mean transforming the training unit in Kenya or expanding its purposes to act as a regional hub for British forces. And combining all these changes within just a period of 10 years, we could point out that this change starts around 2015, 2014. Uh, we have the commitment to permanent naval deployment. Britain didn't have that, uh, that kind of thing in the Indo-Pacific since the 70s, uh, with, with exception to the deployments to Hong Kong. So it's a significant change in, in when we compare, it, we compare it to the British presence in the decades, decades before. Now, we, in the early 2020s, Britain's presence in the Indo-Pacific is more considerable, is more significant, is more significant than its presence in the South Atlantic. And that is a novelty. It was not the case until the mid-2010s. We could point out that the Falklands uh, contributed to a British presence in the South Atlantic that was second only to its own presence in Europe and the Mediterranean, in the Euro-Atlantic axis of NATO. So that change, we could argue, as now finishing my presentation, because of the, the 10 minutes, I think I'm already going beyond the 10 minutes mark. So uh, that changed it. And despite that, those changes that we witnessed in the last 10 years, the last decade, uh, the British presence in the South Atlantic still outmatches its own presence in the Indo-Pacific in the sense that in the Indo-Pacific, Britain has a lot more challenges or challengers to its position. And uh, it, it relies on, on partners to have a regional position. While in the South Atlantic, if necessary, and that's mostly the case, Britain relies on itself. It has a sovereign presence through its overseas territories. While in the Indo-Pacific, Britain has as its territory there, the as remaining territory there, only one, which is the British Indian Ocean Territory with the Anglo-American base of Diego Garcia. So as a, as a conclusion, we have a rapid expansion of British force in the last 10 years in the Pacific, a stability in the South Atlantic, uh, Britain's presence in the region in the, in the regions east of Suez is still a long way to go, although the trend is one of expansion with the AUKUS agreement, etc. And the overseas territories with the cuts to defense expanding uh, and the reliance on even more commitments with the return to the Indo-Pacific or return to the east of Suez regions. Uh, this, these territories are only growing in relevance within the context of supporting the UK's global reach and position. So I think that's more or less everything I have to say. Of course, if you have any questions, please feel free. It would be a pleasure to answer that, answer everything. Great. Thank you so much, Hal. Um, Zeno, would you like to offer your observations? And then, as yeah, please do pop questions in the chat if you have them. Hey everyone, hello. Good afternoon. Can you see me? Yes. So, uh, thank you, Ellen and Vitor. Thank you so much uh, for this fascinating pre presentation. And by the way, um, Vitor and I, although I'm not Vitor's supervisor, um, I'm his host here at King, so we have been talking throughout the year, and I've also read some uh, a shorter version of his dissertation and also some some drafts, some parts of it, and. Um, I, I think you are dealing with a very, very important topic. 
and and also I want to explain uh, explain why. And I think actually this is something that be, because you have laid out in the quite in details what's the situation on the ground, perhaps explaining this context is also what might um, make not necessarily make this research more interesting, but might emphasize what, even more why why it matters why. Uh, it is important, and I think it is important because um, there is a, an ongoing discussion uh, within British uh, uh, policy circles, foreign policy circles, about um, you know the future of British, Britain, uh, UK foreign policy, especially after Brexit, especially when at a time when we, uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, going to the Indo-Pacific. But actually, we have a lot of dilemmas when it comes to the Indo-Pacific. I think most of these are caused by the, the fact that we struggle to decide um, what to do with China, how to handle China in different uh, uh, forums or with regard to different um, uh, scenarios. So the, the, it, it's, it's not the, the Pacific tilt is not, is not a, a, an easy one. So I think perhaps this this should uh, this is an aspect that should come up um, come across more more explicitly uh, in your presentation in, in your paper um, and and I think underlying to your research what I perceive and that's that's why I think this is a very potentially you have a very policy relevant contribution there which doesn't mean it could not be published. In, in academic papers, and I'll get to that. Um, I think there is an underlining question, at least I see it that way, and this is what, what should the country prioritize at a time of limited uh, uh, resources? And, and I think this is something you could perhaps reflect more in depth in your paper, could be at the beginning or could be uh, uh, at the end, and clearly, more clearly lay out what is the so what of this research. So ultimately, why are you, uh, why are you taking, are you looking at these two regions? Why are you looking at uh, this this time frame, for example? Okay, I get it. It is after the Cold War uh, and the post Cold War years are the beginning of, um, uh, you know, probably thousands, thousands of uh, researches. And um, and so that could, could come out uh, a bit more more strongly. Um, and and also I think not only why you're doing that, but also where is the main contribution? Because you're touching on uh, first of all, you're touching, you're looking at two regions, and you're looking at British foreign policy. I think in a con context of a changing world order, because it's a long. Is, is a fairly long. It's we're looking at the last talking about the last 30 years, uh, and so also I think it would be important to emphasize what is um, the what are the main takeaways, what what are the main contributions? Are you thinking of providing a theoretical contribution? Perhaps it doesn't sound so at this stage, but that doesn't mean you could not do that. You could infer it. You could infer some theoretical reflections. From your empirical studies, or or you could spell more spell out more clearly whether this is a whether there is some new new data. I think there are interesting data coming out of this research, and so you're making a more uh, empirical uh, contribution. And I think uh, reflecting on these issues also leads you to another question, which uh, you should probably consider. When uh, certainly at this stage, and also when you're going to submit the paper, and this is the following: um, Are you looking at making a contribution to, broadly speaking, international relations uh, debate, or are you thinking more in terms of area studies? Um, I, I don't think this is a tremendously important question. Um, I think often is you know to to manage to. The main thing for me is to manage to publish uh, a good article, get your ideas out there, you know, make provide your points clearly. Uh, but that perhaps might have an impact on on the sort of people, on the sort of scholars 
you're going to engage with uh, over the years in your uh, um, uh, in your future careers after after the PhD. That means that you might get involved with you know, this or that group of scholars and in this or that sort of special issues or conference or being invited to give talks in uh, in different places or uh, institutions. So I, I think that's something to consider further down the line. Uh, anyway, uh, to sum up, I think in terms of taking taking this forward, I, as I said at the start, I think I, I really see the possibility of a policy relevant contribution presented in, a, in a, you know, in, with academic rigor, uh, because that's what we have to do. So I wonder whether you might consider uh, tailoring your work, N not at this stage, but further down the line, you might consider uh, that there's different journals who who would welcome a, a reflection on on this on this very important subject um, to which I want to go back to in a minute. Uh, survival, Rusi, uh, the Washington Quarterly Global Global Policy uh, Analysis, which is one of the ISA sponsored uh, journals. So th I think these are all. Um, uh, journals to to take in mind okay when when you know polishing your your research um and i think there are potentially there are two points i said before that uh, the argument could come out more strongly i think there are two points you two contributions you could make um i think on the one hand uh, you might challenge the consent, the current consensus, or cr think critically about the, the general consensus that the UK is, should go to the Indo-Pacific. And uh, you wouldn't be the only one, but I, I think this is still not explored academically. There have been discussion in parliaments, of course, and that's why probably the Pacific tilt of the UK is a little bit ambiguous. Um, and, and, and there has been a tilt but not in, in with the sort of on the scale that perhaps the the, the idea of a Pacific tilt uh, implied. At least many assumed that it was going to be something more ambitious, perhaps. Um, but also you could you could use these reflections further down the line to think critically about this concept of global Britain, which is meant to uh, drive frame uh, UK foreign policy after Brexit. I think until recently this has been defined as this has been associated to the UK going to the to the Pacific. There is an assumption that global Britain is uh, mostly about that. Uh, but actually, perhaps you can offer some food for thoughts to policymakers and make them um, uh, reconsider that. Uh, perhaps I'll stop here, uh, Ellen and, and Vitor. Thank you, Zeno. Uh, thank you very much. Um, did you want to respond? Yeah. Oh, um, just uh, very quickly because I know uh, Dr. Leon has just a few minutes left. Uh, well, uh, first, thank you for your comments. Uh, and yes, I, I agree with basically all your your points. the The question is that it's the at this moment it's a very empirical research right now. Uh, mm -hmm. It's still a in the early stage, I went after data about the British presence in the South Atlantic, the British presence in the in the Pacific, and I, and now I'm at the moment of this presentation, I'm trying to insert the discussion this presence within the topic of power projection, the role of the overseas territories, and the the, the position of the UK as a power with limitations, mm -hmm. with increasing limitations in the US decades, but uh, showing that w even with those limitations, I think that's the point I'm trying to, to make, the ter one of the points actually, the, the overseas territories, they cheapen the British presence overseas. They act in a way that re reduce the expenditures in some, sen some, some, some sense. And then in the other way, I was trying to go after that as after the the question of global britain as well i think i have to explore more dedicate, dedicate more time and more consideration about the ways of put of in, inserting the idea of global britain of the british tilt within the 
the concept of, which I mentioned about the limitations of the UK in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So that's more in line of us, us trying to, 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 to do that. That just reinforces what I, I had in mind. And it's, and it's, I hope that you send it, send the article in a later stage and see what you have to, as an opinion, as your comments within a few weeks. <laughs> Thank you, Vitor. Uh, yes, no, I, I appreciate your points. I guess it's also, uh, I guess some some of my, I, I guess every every scholar reacts differently to what they read. They read depending also on their uh, background on on what they research on. So I, I know I have a tendency to uh, look at the the bigger picture. Um, so I I totally understand that. Um, uh, perhaps I think. Providing some some context there to those very important points, it's it's it, 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 you know it will make your research more uh, comprehensive, also uh, more understandable to those who are less familiar with um, uh, yes. certain more technical aspects or more operational aspects. Uh, they will be able to uh, relate to it, to to link uh, the, their expertise yes. to. Um, to, to, to what you're trying to achieve. Sure, yeah, one, one, one last point I, I, I was going to mention is the emphasis I need to make, which I don't know if I made it was clear or not, the that uh, the resources in the South Atlantic that Britain has a is able to obtain a relatively comfortable strategic position there, it's, they are and have been surpassed by the expenditures on the Indo-Pacific, and the results are not the same. Uh, the results for the Britain's relative position in the Indo-Pacific are not the same in the sense of the weight that Britain has in that region compared to its own position in the South Atlantic. So it, that goes within the discussion you mentioned about the limitations and the costs of the British tilt and the returns of this tilt to British, Britain's mm -hmm. national interests as well. So okay. That's, that's one you. of the last points. Thank you very much.